So talk yeah. to us, tell us the things, Rich. Where do you start with building out an offer? I'm going to share with you seven of what I call the seven steps to building a really highly desirable offer. All right, you ambitious business owners. Today's episode is so incredible, honestly, because it's all about creating offers that are so irresistible. Your clients are practically going to be throwing their money at you. I promise. I'm your host, Deirdre Martin. And if you're like me, you've probably had those moments where you've launched something, maybe had an offer and nobody has bitten. You've heard crickets. It's totally deflating and it doesn't have to be that way. And imagine this, imagine that you were to put an offer out in the world and it's not just selling, it's flying off the virtual shelves. Your inbox is flooded with eager inquiries. Your calendar is booked solid and you're wondering why the heck you didn't do this sooner. That's the power of an irresistible offer, my friends. And that's exactly what we're diving into today with our special guest, Rachel Howarth. Who is Rachel, you might be asking. She's not your average business coach. She's an ex-corporate sales whiz turned multi-six-figure entrepreneur, and she's on a mission to empower 100,000, 100,000 women to build thriving coaching businesses. Now, blokes, if you are listening, this episode, honestly, it's it doesn't matter whether you're male, female, or anything else, you're still going to get so much value from it. So stay tuned. But Rachel, she knows how to make sales fun. And you can hear it in our conversation. She knows how to make them fun, feminine, and best of all, financially rewarding. And she's spilling all of her secrets with us today. We're going to be chatting about everything from uncovering your client's deepest desires to creating offers that literally sell themselves. So grab your notebook, get your favorite pen out, and get ready to transform your business into an offer generating machine. Seriously. But before we jump in, I've got a really quick favor to ask. If you're finding this podcast valuable, hit that subscribe button, leave us a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. It helps other really incredible entrepreneurs like you to find our little corner of the internet. And it keeps me motivated to bring you the best guests and advice just like you're about to hear today. Okay, enough chit chat. Let's bring on the offer queen herself, Rachel Horth. Rachel, you are very welcome. Thank you so much. Honestly, I'm so, so glad to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, listen, today we're going to chat about all things, all things offers and building your offers out and where to start with all of that, because it can be really freaking scary with the whole thing. It's like you can sell other people's things, but creating your own is, ah. So talk to us, tell us the things, Rich. Where do you start with building out an offer? I'm going to share with you seven of what I call the seven steps to building a really highly desirable offer. (laughs) Before I share those steps, I think the point that I would absolutely like shout from the rooftops to anybody who will listen is that building your offer is like the number one step. Because I see so many people spending hours and hours and hours on social media and doing all the things, filming the reels, writing all the captions, researching all their hashtags, spending hours. I mean, we know how long it takes, don't we, to create content consistently. It is a never ending machine. Mm -hmm. And to do that without having an offer is literally wasting time and energy I could not be more clear and direct with that feedback for for anybody that comes into my world where I look at their bio and there's no offer there's no link there's nothing because the one thing I really want all the listeners to really get a deep understanding of is the fact that your audience is savvier cleverer more switched on than they ever have been ever before and that is because there is so much information out there they love to research so by the time that somebody actually reaches out and inquires with us they've already done so much stalking of you that you don't even know that they're doing and so if you don't have an offer if you haven't got it in your bio you haven't got it in your highlight reels if you're on instagram or in your featured post if you're on linkedin 
if you're if you aren't putting your offer out there for people to stalk you on you are literally wasting so much of the effort that you're putting into the content so I absolutely want to bang that point home as much as possible because it's the most common mistake I see. You, you must see it as well, right? That makes so much sense. I completely agree. And this is something that comes up a lot for me with my clients in Business Accelerator and even with some of the one-to-one clients I have as well. And we we're talking about content strategy. And my question to them is, okay, so what is your business goal for this month? What are you selling this month? Because then we need to align your content with what your business is. But what does that really mean? means what's your offer so it makes so much sense yeah I'm like oh I'm so boss let's go I want to hear these seven steps <laughs> yeah. how can you how can you create content that aligns with an offer that you have got exactly. and what if this is the expectation that we all need to go into content creation with what if the content is so good that a handful of people reach out to you maybe more if you aren't able to handle that inquiry because you haven't set your price yet, you haven't considered whether you could, you're going to offer a payment plan or you haven't even named it yet or you haven't structured, you don't have to have built the whole offer, but you haven't structured what the curriculum or the process or what the package involves. You haven't set all those things up when somebody slides into your DMs to say, hey, I'd love to hear more about your offer. What if you can't answer them? <laughs> and then the energy is all wrong because you're on the back foot thinking, oh, I need to create all this stuff now. And yeah, I'm absolutely like offer creation, number one thing. So of these seven steps that I said I was going to share, the first one is your offer has got to have a big, powerful promise. It's got to have a clear, very tangible result. And when I teach Big Powerful Promise, I teach it from the perspective of buyer behavior, because there's really five things that buyers want, and these things underlie everything else. And so sometimes the clients that I work with in my business will say, I think this is the result I'm selling. I think this is the powerful promise. And actually they're at surface level and they need to go a few layers deeper to really get to what buyer behavior dictates is the real thing that people want. So the five things that sit underneath buyer behavior, I call it my worth model. The W stands for wealth. If, you, if we're going to have a big powerful promise that makes people money, they're going to buy it. Yeah. The O stands for opportunities. And so that would be things like by by behavior, by motivations would be for opportunities would be things like new adventures, like things you want to explore, things you want to discover, things you want to learn, personal growth and development, that sort of thing. Anything that brings a new opportunity, people will invest in. The R of worth is relationships. People will always invest in relationships, like people either want to find love recover from love, repair relationships, create forgiveness, like anything around relationships makes your offer investable. The T is for time. We all pay more money for time. Anything that, you know, anything that speeds a process up or gets things done quicker or hiring a cleaner to save time, hiring a VA to hire, save you time, anything to save time will make people buy and then I'm he, just thinking about my Mr. Zippy, my robot Hoover, who I turned off yeah. before we started recording. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. And the H is for health. Like we all want to invest in our health. So the worth model is what I would teach underneath the powerful promise. If your powerful promise doesn't touch on one of those, maybe even two of those worth model buyer motivations, then it's probably not powerful enough to make people want to buy it. And how can people figure out which one it is or if there are two, those deeper layers that you mentioned? So I would always, when you think that you, good old journal and exercise is great to this, write down what you think the result is that your offer creates and then ask yourself, why is that important? And write down the answer to that. And then ask yourself, and why is that important? And then write down the answer to that. And when you get to the end, when you're like, that is the ultimate, like there isn't anything below that, 
then you've found what the real reason is. For example, you could have somebody, a client who says to you, I really want to make more money. And you go, okay, if you took that on face value, you would say that is a money motivated person. They just want to make money. But if you then follow up their response of, I just want to make money with brilliant. You want to make money, how much money? And they give you a figure and then you go, okay, and what are you going to spend it on? How's the money going to impact your life? Why is it important? And they say, because we're saving up to move house. And you go, oh, brilliant. Love moving house. What's causing the house move? What's going on behind that? And they say, actually, like we want to have another child. Oh, so you haven't got enough bedrooms in your house. No. So you're planning to move house because you want to have another child. Your family is expanding. Suddenly that is not a money motivated person. Suddenly that is somebody that's motivated by family and growing their family. And that's a very different concept. So just asking why is critical to get to the root cause. That makes so much sense. And I hope for listeners that th you do this exercise, that big, powerful promise, work out why is that important under Rach's work framework. I love that. Love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's the first step. The second step to build in a really great investable offer is having a clear method or framework. And if that can be proven as well as clear, then even better. Yeah, so proven would mean that you've helped people using that framework in the past. So it could be a coaching framework if you're a coach. It could be a consulting method, a way that you would go in to support a, cult, a consulting client, what, what process you follow. It might be that you are running an agency and helping people with their marketing and you, you have a, a very clear set process that you use which starts with discovery and goes into strategy and then goes into tactics, like any form of clear process. And if you can take that to the next level by giving that process a name, a graphic, a logo, a trademark, then it becomes really exciting for people because it then looks so much more credible and authoritative and like something that we feel compelled to invest in. So if you can demonstrate your clear framework, your clear process, even, even better if you get the trademark and the logo and, and all that stuff as well. Okay, I get it. And I can see I'm picturing different things that maybe I've bought over the years and I'm like, ooh, yeah, I want a bit of that because the offer is, that's part of the offer. It's not the entire offer but I want that system that takes me step by step to get this result yeah yeah who doesn't want that yeah, exactly because ultimately buyers want to feel safe and from yourself like I know from myself when I'm investing in anything it doesn't matter what it is I want to feel that it's a safe investment and that I'm not wasting my money or wasting my time or wasting my energy with that investment so to see that there's a clear thought out process gives me a feeling of safety. Mm. And when we feel safe, we're more likely to spend money. And when we feel safe, we're more likely to spend more money. So if anybody listening is selling a high ticket, if you're not sharing your process, then start sharing your process and you'll notice high ticket buyers will be more likely to invest. Mm, that makes so much sense and I see that a lot as well with clients and I see it in my own business like the feedback I get is dear do we love that you give us the tools because they're step by step and we know what we need to do next and it's I think that's where people often get stuck isn't it like the people who are not getting results is because they start spinning their wheels when they're not sure what to do next but if the coach, consultant, service-based business owner has a process, then that client, you just know, okay, you're just stuck on step number two. We need to, you need to do this bit and then you can move forward into step number three. Yeah, absolutely. And the more that as sellers, we can showcase how we've been able to help people previously move from step two to three or overcome the common mistake that people make at step four or be able to shortcut the whole process of doing all the steps in a weekend like whatever it is if we can tell 
relatable stories about the time when I helped somebody to overcome that, this is what we did, then that makes your particular offer really compelling for people. And it positions you as that expert that you want to be seen as because when they know that this isn't your first rodeo, they feel even safer because it's like, okay, she gets it. She's done this before. Like she is somebody that I want to have my arm around me because she can lead me to where I want to go. Yes. And I'm just thinking to the very first thing that you said as well, Rich, in terms of content and that there's no point creating the content until you have the offer. And what's jumping out at me right here, right now in this is whether you share your name of your offer, the graphic, the logo, the trademark, or any of those things throughout your content, while you're promoting this particular offer in a month, you can talk about this stage in the process or that stage in the process or a client who got exceptional results when they did this, which is part of your process, your framework or whatever. So there's so many ways that you can weave this into your story to build more authority, like you said, isn't there? Yeah. So yeah, uh, I'm loving this clear method framework. It needs to be proven or clear. It needs a name, a graphic, a logo, or a trademark. And then that's your framework or method. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Are we ready wow. for step three? Let's yeah. So step three is in the building of your offer. It needs to be value for money. Mm. It needs to be value for money. And this, when I teach this to my students, I use a pair of scales like a pair of weighing scales because value for money is where what you get outweighs what you spend yeah so the scales are tipped in the favor of what you get that is simply the best way to understand value for money this is so important actually and the minute you said value for money like my brain lights up going yeah I really agree with this and there's a couple of things that that I that I want to talk to you about on this the first thing what you said there what you get must outweigh what you spend so the client is getting more than what they think they're going to get and for me this reminds me of is there is a value equation and customer experience that I've shared I share this all the time it's where somebody is going to deem to have gotten good experience, uh, good value if the experience exceeds their expectations. Yeah. So it's like you say on the scale. So their experience needs to be the one that is pulling the scales down on the left hand side or, or yeah, because it's been so heavy and action packed with value. And then they're going to walk away with five star ratings. They're going to become those loyal yeah. advocates and all that, aren't they? Yeah, Absolutely. I, for me, value is such a critical thing for people to understand because one of the areas where I do see people spinning their wheels is around pricing because it's such a common misunderstanding, a total untrue myth that if you price something low, you'll sell it faster or you'll find more people that want to buy it. People always think if it's low ticket, it'll be easy to sell that's not necessarily true. If it's value for money, it will be easy to sell. Yeah. And that could be something value for money. That's a really high ticket offer, or it could be value for money. That's a low ticket offer, or it could be somewhere in the middle as long as it's value for money. And so as buyers, where do we position value in our own minds? We position value at the price point. So I always say, if I was going to take you for dinner tonight, which would be really fun. That would be <laughs> really- if I was going to take you for dinner and I said, Deirdre, it's on me. Let's go and have dinner. Choose between these two restaurants. And I showed you the menu and you knew nothing else about the restaurants. But one of the menus, the starters were like a fiver and the main courses were like 12 quid you would be like, okay, that one looks okay. Show me the other one. And that one had starters for 30 quid and main courses for 60 quid. Which do you think is the better restaurant? I would think that the more expensive one is the better restaurant. Automatically, we think that the more expensive restaurant is going to be the better. We think better food. We would imagine it to have a a more salubrious like interior and feel a bit more luxury and premium that the service would be better we expect all those things because of the price you know be careful anyone listening if you are of that mindset of 
oh, sell it cheap so it sells easier. That's not necessarily always the case because value perception is at the price point. We perceive it to be better when it's more expensive. Doesn't always mean we can afford it or we want to make the investment. We still need the other things to make us want to invest. But it is a myth that selling low makes it easier to sell. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's so interesting. And like last week I did some live master classes and I got people to work out what they want the revenue to be. And it was really funny. I'm like, I bet you probably 60% of you are going to say you need to put your prices up. And they were on like, yep, prices to go up, prices That's to always. go up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But Rach, something that I see happening quite a lot, and I do this, and I've been guilty of this, is that when I'm trying to give people value for money, the one thing that I consistently find myself giving them over and over again is more of my time. And the time is one thing that, you know, it's in short supply. So how can people give more value for money without giving away all of their time? What do you suggest? I think the best way, and this is going to be the most helpful for anybody in your audience who is an educator of some type, a coach, a mentor, a consultant, a trainer, is that when you are asked a question, that you actually answer it twice. This is one of my rules of life. Yeah, I learned this way back in my corporate career, and it has always served me well. When somebody asks you a question, and this goes for problem solving as well, when a problem arises, solve it twice. So when I say twice, once for the person who's asking it, because they're asking it to you for the first time, and then second for all the other people in the future that have that very same question. So if we answer it twice, you would give the service and give the support to the person who is craving that from you, but then you don't quickly move on to the next thing and forget that question was ever asked. You create a worksheet or create a resource or create a piece of training or an FAQs document or something that means that next time somebody asks that, you can signpost them to the resource. Yes, yes. It's so funny you say that. Last week I had my VA go into our community and look at all of the questions that have been asked and all of the answers I gave and to create an FAQ bank on Notion. And I'm like, okay, that's content inspiration right there. That's Hopefully. stuff that I can include in my program. I'm like, there's so much value in that for sure. And Rach, another thing that comes to mind as well is that difference between a low ticket offer and a high ticket offer. So imagine that I've been selling my high ticket offer over and over again, and it's going super well. And I'm like, I'm oversubscribed and I can't take any more of those. And I'm like, okay, I want to create a low ticket offer, like a digital course that doesn't take time. And the goal would be, I'm guessing, and you can tell me whether this is right or wrong, but the goal in my view, where, where, or how I would approach it is that the people that I would sell that low ticket offer to would be ideal clients for the high ticket offer. But this is just a way to get them to start to engage with me. And I suppose the question there is, how much do you give them in that low ticket offer so that number one, they get a result and number two, that they feel, oh, this was only this much. I wonder what I get in that one. Where do you draw the line with value in, in that circumstance? Yeah, so I think the first thing for me with that is always that if the business model is built, and I do this because I build it on a diagonal line, like a lab, like going up the page. Um, if the business model is built fundamentally for the same person, but at different stages of their journey, then that's going to make this super easy. If people have got different, I've definitely made this mistake when I first started my business. I had different offers, work, which were actually for different people. So there wasn't that like natural evolution. If you've built your business model so that somebody could be in your world for free, following you on Instagram, for example, in your LinkedIn network, following you for free, they see something that you put out there that's a free resource. They then get led to maybe through a funnel, maybe through some other mechanism, they then get led to a low ticket course. Like I've got a course for £27, which gets sold immediately after somebody has downloaded a free DM script from me. So it's like, now you've got the script. Do you want the whole course on how to use it? 
And that's one of my most high selling courses. So if you've got that like natural evolution, great. And then they will naturally get to the high ticket offer when they're ready. As long as you are making it clear who each offer is for and at what stage of the journey they are going to be ready to buy it. But to come back to the point around what is too much value, you wouldn't sell a £27 course and give them all the resources that you would put in your mastermind. What you need to do is create the win for the promise that you made. So step two, big, powerful promise. Whatever the promise is, you need to deliver that. And if you can go a little bit above and beyond that and say, here's what it would look like if we work together some more, or if we work together in a deeper way, or if we work together on this issue now, now that you know how to sell in the DMs, now you must want to know how to close sales calls. Yes. If we build the business model right, and we make sure that we've got that step two in place, the clear, powerful promise, no matter what price point it is, every offer needs a powerful promise. As long as we meet the promise and we go a little bit over it, then that's, that's good for me. Okay, great. Fantastic. I love that answer and I'm loving these steps. Okay. What's <laughs> step number four? Yeah. Number four is to have some sort of motivating bonus or incentive to help the buyer get excited about the purchase. So that could look like when you buy this course, you also get invited to a group coaching Q&A call with me or included in this course, you get an hour's onboarding call with me, depending on what price point and level that you're selling that at. So some sort of like motivating bonus. And when I teach this, I would normally teach that if you're selling something like a membership or a group coaching program or a mastermind, typically I would say have three bonuses. And then we, and then create what I call a value stack, which is where you outline what the value of the bonus is. And obviously then make the point that they're getting that for free. So you're like building the value perception. Wow. So this, this is worth a thousand pounds, but you're getting it for free. This is worth 500 pounds, but you're getting it for free. So then when you present the price, you're then able to say, you're invited to join this course for 497 and you're also getting these three bonuses that are worth X and you're only paying Y. Okay. So we're like building that value perception. So having a motivating bonus, having an incentive. This is one thing that I um, did this weekend is I brought forward a course that I have been really excited to sell. I was going to sell it in the autumn. It's called She Claims Abundance. And it's a money mindset course. And I was like so excited to put it out there. And I was like working on the curriculum in the background. But I just had this feeling on Saturday. It's bank holiday. I want to do a bank holiday offer. And I really feel called to do that course and do the live delivery of it for five weeks. So I put it out on Sunday morning with a deadline of Monday night Dubai. And 19 amazing people came and joined the course. And there was no bonuses with that other than the fact that I was selling it as a beta. So it's not built, it's not finished, it's not built. There's no curriculum to see. I, I told them what the process was I was going to teach them. But 19 people came and joined that program because it ticked the boxes that we're going through. It had the big powerful promise. It had the clear method. It was value for money because the price point was low because it was a beta. And that price point counted as my motivating bonus. And then as we go through five, six, and seven, you'll see that it, it had all the other things as well. And so it sold like hotcakes. I love that. Sold like hotcakes. Fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what a hotcake is, do you? Are we here no, the I, I don't, don't think I know either. Yeah. What is the hotcake? I and don't know. <laughs> Somebody listening will have to send us a DM to let us know what a hotcake is. I yeah. bet somebody <laughs> out there must know what a hotcake is. <laughs> We're going to get this random DM when the podcast goes live with a, po a hotcake is sex. We're going yeah, to yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I've got a question on the bonuses as well. 
well, right? And the incentive. So I'm thinking some listeners are accountants, they're bookkeepers, they're engineers, but they're in those kind of professional services type businesses. Or maybe they have, maybe they're web designers. What sort of bonuses or extra incentives could they include to motivate purchase? So things like an audit is really good. So like auditing before you start a piece of work, a certain whatever the delivery of the work is, auditing where you are at the beginning is often very good. So if you're a web designer, a free audit could be really good. Also things like things that are community based are very good as bonuses and things that save time. So whenever I put a bonus out that is get my email sequence or get my funnel tracker, people want to buy that because all they see with that is she's done this before, she knows how to do it, and she's going to give me her own tools, which is going to save me so much time. So anything that saves people time, a done for you thing, if you're an accountant, it could be that you're going to host once a month an, a, an open drop-in call for questions. That sounds, at the point of purchase, that would make you stand out over and above all the other accountants. In practice, it's not actually going to take you much time and effort at all. And all it's really going to serve to do is make your customer feel even closer to you, which is going to boost your retention and stop them ever wanting to leave you. So it's a sales bonus, and it's also a customer service and retention tool as well. So there's yeah, nobody of- might show up and you can work away for an hour, but like the offer is there. The offer was there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Love that. Great suggestion. So things that save time are things that are done for you. Fantastic. Let's be having number five, Rich. <laughs> Let's be having number five. <laughs> number five is testimonials and return on investment stories. So as buyers as investors it we all I think we all know this anyway so this is probably no surprise to anyone we know that we feel more confident to spend money when we see that other people have got a great result first we just naturally are more likely to reach for our credit card if we are on a sales page or on a website or on a call with somebody and they say somebody that did this last week was able to achieve this or the last hundred people that came through this course achieved this whatever we can share in terms of a testimonial a client review or a what I call a return on investment story is gold like that does your marketing for you and one of the sort of structures that I would teach people in terms of how to tell a return on investment story I teach the car framework so like The C stands for context. So what was the context? What was the situation before the person came to work with you? The A of car stands for action. What was the action that you took together? What did the customer do? What did you do? And then the R stands for results. What was the outcome? So I did, for example, an Instagram live with a lady in my mastermind the other day. And we structured the interview around the car framework. And at the beginning, she said, when I came to work with you, I was doing 5K a month in my social media management business. And I wanted to transition to be a coach. And now I've just done my first 20K month and I've got a very established coaching business. So in terms of the story, does that position me as the person that people want to come and work with? Absolutely. Because... It's a real life person telling a real life story. And within that story, we were able to dip into certain things that we knew the listeners would be maybe feeling overwhelmed with themselves or maybe feeling that something was particularly hard or they couldn't do it. There was a real life person telling a story. So if if anybody's listening and you have got a happy customer that would love to get their face on video or love to do a side-by-side like Zoom interview with you or equally if they want to just tap you out a text, put it in written form, anything like that is going to help your offer to sell. 
such a great idea and I love your framework and I I do one similar I call it bab like it's the before after bridge (laughs) and it's like where were they before where were they after and what was the bridge that got them there so you're the bridge and your process your framework is the bridge and the actions that they took too I love it and one of the things that I think at Rich is the testimonials like some people and I've experienced this and a lot of my clients are like but dear Jared, they won't come on camera or but dear Jared, they won't do this or they won't do that and a case study I think is as good of a way almost to share that too because in your case study really succinctly you can outline the method that they use so you can break down the bits of the offer and the steps in your process, right? Or have you got any suggestions for case studies, Rich, that people could use? Yeah, absolutely. Like we have a case study, like a slide that we've created in Canva that where we want to really showcase the result that somebody's been able to get. We literally have the context action result on a slide, or you could spread it out over multiple slides. But I think showcasing it is really important. Mm. And just because somebody won't come on video doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a testimonial. The question that I always get asked is, but Rachel, I've never sold this before. So I haven't got any testimonials on this offer. Yes. And I always say you are your testimonial Mm -hmm. because the first person that probably got the result was probably you. Mm -hmm. That program that I sold this weekend, nobody's been on that before. It's a beta. It's brand new. Mm -hmm. But the framework that I've built is called my 5D infinite abundance method. And I am the case study because I started my business from zero. I'm now at multi six figures. How did I do it? I use this 5D framework. Mm -hmm. So it's a money mindset framework. I'm going to walk people through it. So the stories that I was telling were my stories. Mm -hmm. So you can be your own testimonial as well. That's absolutely okay to do that. Yeah. And I think testimonials you've gotten from other clients and other things are okay to use as well. And again, something you mentioned earlier is if it's a coaching framework, it's proven already, even if it's not yours and you've not done it before, because if if there's a clear method or framework, or if it's a consulting method and you've learned that somewhere or, and the place that you've learned it, they've been able to get results for other people, then it's okay to use that as well for, because that lends also to testimonial and ROI stories because other people have gotten them with that framework albeit it may not have been you that's not misleading in my view do you think that's misleading rich no absolutely not one of the first testimonials that i used when i started my business was a snippet from a linkedin recommendation Mm -hmm. and it was a really long recommendation that i wouldn't have published the whole thing it was like really long so i just took out the snippets that showed me as the person that i thought people would want to come and work with so it wasn't even in relation to an offer but I don't see that as misleading because people are investing in me, in you, in whoever. And yeah, I think it's very easy to get our little mindset gremlins working overtime on, am I good enough? Should I be doing this? What if I'm being compared with somebody else? And when we learn to get over those things and just get out of our own way and say, listen, if all these people have said amazing things about me, why am I not shouting that from the rooftops? We've just got to be proud of what we've accomplished. Yeah. And I think, and and on that point, I think every so often, sometimes th- there's a perception or maybe a misconception out there that you can only ask for a testimonial when you're finished working with the client. But if you've got an ongoing relationship with the client, you can ask them for a testimonial anytime you like. And yeah. I would say a time to ask them is when they say thank you for something. When they say thank you, they're so grateful and appreciative that you can again, in a nice way, leverage that and reciprocity and invite them to give you a testimonial. So you send them an invitation because they're feeling thankful because you've just helped them do something amazing or they've achieved something they hadn't been able to achieve before. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a good time to ask. Do you agree? Yeah, 100%. I I was having a conversation yesterday with a client who she calls herself the self-confessed people pleaser. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, like, I know I'm like always trying to over deliver and over give and like people please. And that feeling of asking for the testimonial in her mind, sometimes we're working on this <laughs> in her mind. It's I shouldn't ask because I'm there to give. 
and I, you know, I should just be giving and asking for a testimonial is, is it too desperate? I'm like, no, it's a celebration. It's a good thing because it shows the, the client in a great light as well. I think you're absolutely right. Ask when they're saying thank you or ask when something amazing's happened because it is a celebration. And especially if you are, if your purpose, like me, I'm a business coach. So my, my success is my client's success. So it's one and the same. And so if they're celebrating something, I am going to be celebrating equally as hard and helping them to lock in those feelings of celebration is actually helping them to break through to their next level. Mm -hmm. Because when we recognize what we've already accomplished, it's then so much easier to see what's next. Mm -hmm. Don't celebrate it. Then we stay down. We stay in the weeds a little bit. Whereas what we want to do is blossom and be like, yes, I did that. So yeah, I'm I'm big into celebration and cheerleading. Yes, yeah, I love love it, love it. Okay, let's be here in number six, Rich. Okay, number six is the oh, this is the one that people don't like. Price. This is the one people don't like. So it is using scarcity and urgency okay. in your marketing to help the buyer to support the buyer to make the investment decision. This is called the seven elements of a highly desirable offer. So for something to be highly desirable, it needs to sell like hotcakes, yeah? So <laughs> what's going to help your offer to sell really well is creating scarcity or some sort of urgency. So It's like the toilet paper during the pandemic. <laughs> yes, exactly. That, that, that demonstrates it perfectly. I, I often get met with resistance from people saying, ooh, ooh, it's a bit icky, isn't it? I don't want to give people a deadline. I, I don't want to say that there's only five spots available to create scarcity. I don't want to do that because it's not genuine and it's out of integrity. And I always say, you make your own integrity. Your integrity is yours. It's nobody else's. So as long as you feel good, that's good enough. And so just because you see other people doing a bad job of scarcity and doing a terrible job of urgency, like publishing fake deadlines and fake scarcity, like saying there's only five spots and selling 15 is not an integrity. Saying there's only five spots and taking it off sale at five spots is integrity. And mm -hmm. the only person who needs to measure your integrity is you. Yes. So if you feel it, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. What I know to be true, though, and, and I'm sure you know this as well as a professional, as an experienced marketer, if you say that there is only so much of something or if you say there's a deadline, People are going to want it even more. And that is a fact. Yeah, toilet paper during the pandemic was <laughs> yes. a huge thing. And then there was, oh, in Ireland, it That's was right. Brennan's bread and tato cheese and onion crisps. Those were the things that just went nuts. There's a fabulous restaurant in Carlo near where I live. And when they open, it's called Mimosa. Shout out to Mimosa. It's called Mimosa. And it's a tapas place. Now, I think... I've been a lot of places around the world and it's got probably the best food, fabulous wine, fabulous ambiance. It's just beautiful place to go. And I'm so blessed that it's so local. But what they did when they launched was so smart. And this really created scarcity and urgency. And they were booked out every single night. What they did was you couldn't book or reserve a table. You had to just show up and hope that you'd get one. So it was like, oh my God, we don't know if we're going to get a table. We need to go early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it's okay. You arrive, they'll put you on the wait list. So you're on the wait list. What do you do? You go to the pub next door. You have a couple of glasses of wine or whatever while you wait to come in. And then you go in and it's, oh, we're so grateful we got to be here. But they did that for several years and people would complain that you can never get a table in there. Why? Because they were fully booked. And yeah. it, it, but when you got your table, you felt so grateful to get your table because they're always so fully booked. I didn't think about it at that time. But since I've learned more about marketing in the last three years, 
they're like a case study that I would use for how to get fully booked and to really include scarcity and urgency, but in a way that is full of integrity. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I think it is true that there are people out there that do scarcity and urgency badly. Like, Mm. of course, there are people that blur the lines and step outside of their own integrity but we don't have to worry about those people because we aren't those people so I always say just forget them like don't let them cloud your view of how you want to operate in your business if you want to say that I only feel good delivering a group coaching program when there are 10 faces looking back at me on zoom then there are 10 spots that is not fake scarcity that is the truth if you know that you're starting a program on Thursday next week and you want everybody in by Tuesday that's the deadline it's not fake it's not out of integrity it's a fact I yeah I would just say to anybody who's now thinking well okay I'm not using those things but maybe I should be just ask yourself what feels good and if it feels good it is good that for me it's as straightforward as that if it feels good it is good Mm mm-hmm yeah love it love it okay I thought you were going to say price was number six so now I'm curious is price number seven no <laughs> seven no because price is included in value for money because ah. obviously not every offer has a price it's yeah. just is it value for money so yeah price is not number seven number seven is actually I, I should probably swap these around and make scarcity and urgency number seven because number seven is inspiring and relatable stories which is like taking people into that concept of content and how here we are in 2024 and you don't need to do paid advertising anywhere anymore. Yes, if you want to scale and go big, great, do paid advertising, but you don't need to because there's so many organic ways to market. There's so many great ways to put your products, your services, your packages, anything that you sell through content And what I see selling best is stories. So if you can, for your offer, for your marketing around your offer, if you can tell inspiring stories through video, through blogs, through your web pages, through your sales pages, through interviews, that is going to help you sell your offer. Okay. Completely agree. And Episode 74, I had Dr. JJ Peterson on and we talked all about story powered marketing and how it can help you succeed in your service business. So if you're like, oh my God, stories, what kind of stories do I tell or how do I tell stories? Go and check out that episode because Rach is 100% right. Stories sell. Yeah. As humans, we are wired to want to close loops on things. So if we hear the start of a story, we are hardwired to want to know the end. It is just the way we are. So given that we hear so many tips on social media around have a great hook, whether it's a verbal hook in a video or a written hook at the top of the page or the first line of your caption, we have to hook people in. And so if you're telling a story and you want to be able to get to the punchline, you've got to have a great hook that makes people want to feel that like, oh, I need to know what happened. So open up the loop and then close the loop. But within that story position, you as the expert, if you are the expert in your business position, you as the coach, you as the mentor, you as the consultant, you as the service provider and the offer. And if you can tell relatable stories and they don't have to be promotional, they can just seed the offer. They can just mention the offer in a quite light touch way. They don't need to be hard and in your face. Mm -hmm. You know, she bought this thing and you need to buy it now by Friday. It doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. It can literally be just that I'm sitting telling you a story and saying, Actually, one of the ladies in my mastermind was telling me that and, and I'm dropping in that I've got a I've got a mastermind. And then later in the story, I might seed what the topics are that we talk about in the mastermind. I might seed some of the results that are being celebrated. So I'm not actually I'm not hard selling it. I'm just telling a story around it. And if we 
if, if we could all get really good at stories, especially given that you've got a great episode for people to go and do that extra piece of learning on it, that's going to help your marketing tenfold, twentyfold, fiftyfold, because we're hardwired to want to know the end of a story. I know it's so true. And last year I read a book and it, it told a story about a woman who woke up in a bath and the bath was filled with ice. And she'd been in an airport that was or something horrible. Like before. It was horrible. And what it was, was it was an urban myth or legend, but I think it probably has happened. Basically, it was where she'd been drugged and abducted and all of her organs had been taken out. And there was literally like, I'm like, oh my God, this makes me want to read more and see what happened. Yeah, but the yeah. book was around virality in terms of your content and how to make your content contagious and how to make people talk about your stories. And I'm like... Oh my God, I was so soaked in. <laughs> yeah, to yeah, totally. yeah. I, think, I, I, I think that the word story gives this implication that it's, I was born in XYZ hospital and after that I went to this school and that's not what we mean by stories. Like you can literally start and end a story in a tiny snippet of life. It doesn't have to be your life story. It can be a story about a client, a story about an offer. It could be a story about something completely separate to your business, complete, like a like an ice bath with organs in it. It could be something completely random as long as it creates the outcome that you really want it to create, which is wanting to know more about you, wanting to know more about what you do, wanting to know more about your business, your offers, and that creates fans, community, supporters yeah I think stories is a bit is a big opportunity area for me it's a big learning area for me because I I want to get a lot better at telling my own stories and helping other people to tell theirs so yeah it's a big thing fabulous Richard oh my gosh okay so let me recap and make sure I've got the seven steps down so big powerful promise number one number two clear method or framework number three value for money Number four, a bonus or incentive to create excitement and motivation to purchase. Number five, testimonials and return on investment stories. Number six, scarcity and urgency. And number seven, inspiring and relatable stories. Have I got yeah. them all? You've got them all. You've got them all. And I, the way that I see it, if your offer has got all seven of those things, it will sell. It will sell. It, it will, will sell. sell. It will absolutely sell. And Rach, if somebody is listening and they're like, I'm just not selling anything right now. <laughs> things are just, because that happens, right? Business ebbs and flows. And sometimes things are cyclical. Sometimes you have weeks, days, weeks, or months or quarters where you're just in, in that stuck in a rut. What should they do to help maybe come out of that deep dark hole that they might feel in so I would always say if somebody who has previously sold things and is then in a period of oh things are just not feeling good right now I would usually say that is not about the offer it's about your energy and your energetic alignment to the offer because I could show up anywhere and try and sell something but if energetically I'm not excited about it if maybe it's an old offer and I'm a bit bored of delivering it or, or it takes me lots of time and I really don't want to do it, like then there's an energetic misalignment there. And so take those seven steps and re-energize yourself around each of those seven things. And it might mean that you need to take your offer apart, work on the messaging, you might need to rename it, you might need to redo the curriculum, you might need to think about your delivery but some how you've come out of energetic alignment to your offer. I, th I think that's a really big thing, especially if you've previously sold it and then it isn't selling. It's mm. probably not the offer, it's probably you. Or it could be that the market has shifted massively. So a bit of market research would be a good thing to do. But usually I find it's about energy. Okay, so hopefully if anybody's listening and you're like, offer, nobody's buying anything, now you know what to do. Come back and realign yourself with your offer and what you're selling. Because the more clients you help, the more money you make, the more money you make, the more clients you can help. 
Yeah. So yeah, love it. Rachel, oh my gosh, this has been such a value packed episode. I know people are going to be like, woo, I can't wait to go and do the work on this. It feels so exciting. Before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to add or share or tell us what's coming up for you? Oh, thank you so much. Honestly, I don't know where the time's gone. Like we've been here an hour, like amazing. It's great, doesn't it? Like I love talking about this stuff. No, all I would say is if somebody wants me to have a little look at their socials, if it is feeling hard, I'm more than happy for anybody to reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is at Rach Howarth. And you will also, given that in step one, I said, make sure that you've got something in your link in bio for people to stalk. There is lots of things in my link in bio for people to stalk. Lots of free downloads. There's a 25 page free content guide there. There's links to masterclasses that are all free because I come from the train of thought. I'm sure you do as well. That You can never do enough for free. I always want to yeah, help my audience and my community to make progress. So yeah, there's, if you want to come and have a little stalk of my Instagram bio, then there are some free things in there for you. Oh, folks, don't you just love it? I talk about giving away the family farm. Rich is literally doing that. So go and check out her LinkedIn bio, her links in her bio on Instagram. And I'm going to drop her handle in the show notes as well. So you can click directly over. And yeah, Rich, you are fabulous. It's just been such a privilege having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. mic drop (laughs) Rachel you've absolutely blown my mind today and let's recap on those seven golden rules for creating irresistible offers in case anyone didn't get my quick summary a minute ago okay so number one was big powerful promise where you need to know your client's deepest desires and make a promise that speaks directly to them number two a clear method or framework so you show your clients exactly how you're going to deliver on that promise with your proven process Number three, value for money. Over deliver, tip that scales in favor of value so your clients feel like they're getting the deal of the century. Number four, bonuses and incentives. Sweeten the deal with irresistible extras that make your offer a complete and utter no-brainer. Number five, testimonials and return on investment stories. Let your happy clients do the selling for you with that powerful social proof. Number six, scarcity and urgency. Use these tools ethically to encourage action and create excitement around your offer. And number seven, inspiring and relatable stories. Tell stories that connect with your audience and leave them wanting to learn more. Now folks, homework. (laughs) My clients love it when I give them homework, so I bet you guys do too. And that's a joke. But do you know what I always used to say when I was in school? The real value every day was not in the study that I did, but it was in the homework that I did. And that was where I learned and I remembered things. And when I did the work, that was where it paid off. So what I want you to do is pick one of Rachel's tips and implement it in your business this week. Don't let this knowledge go to waste. Honestly, there's so much value in what everything Rachel shared today you should not let this go to waste. And folks, if you love this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with your fellow entrepreneurs. Tag us on social media. Let's spread the love of offer building. And your shares, your reviews, they're really what helps us keep this podcast going and growing. Plus, it's a great way to pay it forward and support other business owners too. So don't forget to check out Rachel's website for a treasure trove of free resources, actually her Instagram rather, and you'll find them on her link in bio. So be sure to follow her over on social media for even more valuable tips. And until next week, keep mastering your business. Bye.